Welcome to Building My Legacy Podcast. This podcast is designed for leaders and entrepreneurs who want to leave a legacy and will provide strategies that focus upon key elements for legacy creation, determining your desired impact and its benefit, increasing your legacy's reach by engaging key stakeholders, planning, prioritizing, and executing. Here's your host, Dr. Lois Sonstegard. Hi, everybody. This is Lois Sonstegard. I'm with Karen Whitaker again today for the second in our series of our Building My Legacy podcast, um, looking at how do we navigate the corporate world. And Karen has such rich, rich um, information to share with us. She's Vice President of Business Development for um, Grin and Beam, um, a medical company in um, Texas, I believe, is it not? And she's here to talk with us about what do you do, how do you navigate when your company has two, perhaps more cultures, and you're working within that environment. So Karen, share with us a little bit about your experience and why culture, what, did that, what does that mean to you? And what does it mean to have more than one culture? What's your experience of that? Right, right. So I think it is important to start with the definition because there, um, that will help us uh, make sure that we're consistent in what you know how we're rep- how we're viewing what culture is and, and talking about that. So one definition that I came across, which I think is encompassing of everything, is that it, it it's the values and behaviors that contribute to the unique social and psychological environment of a business. It's basically the um, it can be. Uh, called the personality of a company, if you will, right? And that is encompassing of the work environment, the company mission, the values, the ethics, the expectations, the goals. Um, um, you know, those are the components that make up uh, that, that personality or, or um, culture. So that's the way I would define it. I um, hopefully we're in agreement on that, <laughs> but um, it's, or in a line, yeah. it's a definition and having a working definition. You're absolutely right. Helps. So what was your experience? So I, um, the, I w- uh, managed a, a, on the field team and um, because I had that position, 50% of my time was spent working with the corporate um, different divisions. And it became very apparent to me that there were, I was existing, I, I had to, I had to live in, in two different cultures. Um, the, explain, were, explain what that means to you. What, how was it living in, what were the two cultures that you were experiencing? Right, right. I'll give you an example. That's the best way for me to explain things. Um, the corporate culture had, um, the, the, physically the, every building had what they called town squares. They even had lampposts and tables and chairs. They encouraged different groups to come together in open environments and share ideas and, and, um, collaborate so that, um, there was transparency and, and ultimately better results because of that. Mm-hmm. Um, the field environment I learned very quickly was not one to, uh, uh, voice your opinion, especially if it differed from um, what leadership is is directing um, the team members to do. So, um, I I was living in one, which was kind of stifling, um, but but aspiring to um, project what the true corporate culture was. And I could only control what I could control. So I could not- okay, so let me just back up. You're trying to project the corporate culture within the field. Within a different okay. yeah, environment. Uh, okay. Mm-hmm. But like I said, I couldn't control anything that was above me. All I could control was what was below me. So I tried to manage my team based on that corporate culture, those, those goals and beliefs and, and um, uh, you know, the company mission. Um, and the challenge with that is how I was perceived as, especially as a female leader, um, you know, was encouraging my team to share different, uh, different opinions and, um, to complain if they wanted to, or, or, you know, that, that, that's, that's, that's what that corporate culture was 
um, trying to cultivate. Um, but because I was doing that with my team, was I seen as weak and not ready for the next level or not, not um, hard enough or too close to my team, those kind of things um, that, that tend to label me a little bit. Okay, so what's interesting with that is it is something that you hear um, periodically, especially with the juxtaposition between um, gender and um, race, perhaps, in leadership, Mm -hmm. is as we have experienced different things, women, people of color, um, have different experiences that cause us sometimes to be more nurturing or right than perhaps our counter male counterparts who are more competitive. And so there's a different way in which we manage things. And it is true. Women are often perceived as being soft or softer for that reason. And the question is, can they then really do what's difficult? So if some people need to be laid off, can they really do that? For example, right. So mm-hmm. go on, share more about that. So, and and um, that's the interesting thing is I have, I, I had let people go. Um, and I, um, so I had demonstrated that I had the ability to be um, decisive in that way if it wasn't the right fit. Um, but I'll give you another example. Um, at the, the corporate um, environment, there were probably about 50-50 on leadership, women and men. Um, in the field, I was, um, out of 80 managers, I was one of five women. So in the field being a sales field. Right. And you're one of 80. One, yeah, out of 80 managers, I was one of five women. So there was five okay. women to 75 men. Got it. Okay. So very di- vastly different than a 50-50 environment at corporate, right? And so then why was that? And what was preventing us from, from um, I, I guess, uh, expanding or, or developing women leaders in the field? And they, at the corporate um, environment, they did a lot of that. They worked very hard at developing people and helping them um, rise um, throughout the organization and, um, and, and giving them different roles to kind of round them out. So there's a lot of that going on at the corporate office. It, in the field, um, I went to one leadership class and one management class, and that was it. So in my 10 years with the company, I had two um, classes where, that taught me how to be a leader. Interesting. So what you're saying is in the, in the corporate structure, the non-field structure, there was a process of growing people, mentoring people, training people, developing people so that they could move throughout the organization. And the policy or the culture was to grow from within Mm -hmm. primarily. So you would hire from within on the field. It was almost the reverse. It was um, sink or swim. Is that, am I getting it? Okay. So there was a sense of, of um, being abandoned, perhaps. Be, I mean, what was the feeling out in the field then as a result of this different um, perspective on employees? For me, it was, if, it, if it's going to be, it's up to me. And um, so I um, – educated myself. I looked for mentors, um, that, that can help me navigate, um, and, and, and did my best, um, to, um, um, to, uh, work on myself personally, but also, um, I had to really play, uh, or hone in on, on some of the skip strengths that I think that I bring, um, which is a very chameleon like uh, person who when I'm in the corporate environment, I can be that person. And then in the field, um, uh, you know, alter myself to, so at corporate in meetings, I could be more verbose with the more um, sharing of my ideas and my thoughts and or my different of, uh, opinions. And then in the field fall in line and, and yes, sir. <laughs> so, 
So part of the, with this, the, the difference in the, the cultures is there was a corporate culture and then there was a field sales culture. Mm-hmm. And what I see happening in larger organizations is interesting is that, um, and I have shared this example with you before, is that um, one large corporation had spent tens of millions of dollars deciding to implement a culture throughout the organization, very large organization. And um, they had invested all this money. And after five years, they had managed to get the culture to 30%. And so you look at that and you say 30%. Who are those 30%? It -hmm. tends to be people in the management, but the people lower down haven't haven't gotten that same message or opportunity to move into that culture, right. cultural perspective or training. I also see it in multinational companies where you have different cultures. So you may be in um, China, for example, as a U.S. multinational, and you have the culture of the U.S. people, you have the culture of the Chinese, and how you treat people may be different. And you know, part of the rationale is, well, that's culture and it's being respectful. Yes, perhaps. And it may, and it's also very well observed. It's talked about um, by the people like the, the other culture and they know they're different, right? Mm -hmm. And the treatment is different. And so there, there's also a, a sense in terms of how do they respond and how do they work in that environment? Because if you're less than, you approach things a little bit differently, don't you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, a, a good uh, to kind of um, uh, add to that, the, my team who didn't have the opportunity to go to corporate, visit corporate, they, they didn't they weren't connecting with that corporate culture on a regular basis like I was. So to your point about that 30% uh, and the 70% that didn't get the message, of course they didn't get the message. When were they brought into that environment? It, it, it doesn't just naturally trickle down. Like I, I felt it because I spent more time at the corporate office and I was connected with it and I interacted with those departments. My team members didn't. So I, 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 the onus was on me then, like I mentioned in the very beginning, to to manage or project that culture through me to my team. You know, there's a marvelous example um, by a consultant who does a lot of work with visioning and for culture development and just vision development. And, and he's written a lovely book. It's very short, but wonderful. It's called Viv- Vivid Vision. And um, what he talks about is we spend all this time creating mission statements and vision statements. We put them on the walls and we want everybody to follow it. But he said, here's the problem. We synthesize it down to one or two lines, right? And then think everybody understands. So it would be like my saying to you, Karen, let's go build a house. And I would like to have, here's our budget um, here's the square footage and, um, I like an open kitchen. And, um, other than that, we, we need a house that we can work in and be efficient for the business. So you go, okay, I got it. We need a nice kitchen. We need a house that's got a little open space so we can interact. Here's my budget. Here are the number of people that we're going to have working within it. And you go off to your cubicle or to your office room or to your home and you start putting together the plan and you come back and you show it to me and I go, that wasn't at all what I was thinking. And so what you did was you created the plan based on the image, your brain started developing from the words I use to describe the house. Mm -hmm. So I use open, I use kitchen, I use people, I use square footage, I use dollars there was still a lot of room for decision-making. Is it going to be a brick house? Is it going to be Tudor style? Is it going to be a ranch style, right? Mm -hmm. And how it looks and feels is so different. So what 
this consultant talks about is what's so important is for us to take time as leaders when we're developing culture, vision, and mission to make the picture so clear and it with so much color, so much detail that when I go back and I'm going to submit, is this what she meant or is that what she meant? I can implement it. Right, right. Right. But if you do that at a corporate level, then the field can also have the vision, right? You can see an image out in the field just as easily as you can in the corporate if it's shared and if it's created. But we don't take the time generally to really create that because we don't know how important that is. I think that's really why. It's just not knowing how important it is and that that picture is what creates clarity. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. So I want I want to move on to um, something else that you began to talk on in terms of culture, and that is that. So our one challenge was different cultures, different attitudes about culture within parts of an organization. And another is um, biases or attitudes about how we. Um, treat one another. And some of this, I think, um, is also gender and perhaps race related in terms of what our attitudes and perspectives are. You want to share what your experience is in that area? Sure, sure, absolutely. So um, the uh, field has a reputation for being a um, good old boys club. So, um, which uh, is so vastly different from the, from the corporate culture. Um, and, uh, you know, being a, a, a woman, um, there were um, a lot of challenges um, moving through the ranks, if you will. Um, I was highly networked within the good old boy club, but um, also I feel like, because I was a woman and because I had to, how I had to navigate that didn't have really um, the um, opportunity to, I was pigeonholed into one position, um, which ultimately was what one of the driving factors for leaving. Um, and. So you were pigeonholed how? Um. It's almost like the well, so it's it's almost like this. How, how in the C suite, the majority of women in 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 a C suite position are in HR. Got it. Okay. Right. That's what the stats it can, say. It can be. Yeah. Right. So, in the field, I was I was a part of the sales team, but I was managing an education department that supported the sales strategy, and to move into a sales leadership role. Um, that wasn't going to be an option for me. Does that make sense? Because it was almost why? like I was in HR. That's a safe place for a female leader. Got it. Okay. This, so this environment it. is too um, cutthroat, perhaps. Male dominated and cutthroat, and I don't think she can navigate. Okay. Navigate. Um. The other thing is looking at the environment I was in, um, again, I told you, you know, one of five women out of 80 um, uh, managers, but um, there were a lot of strong women um, in the organization that, that had, had they been developed, um, could, could also um, assume leadership roles. But I don't think that the, the good old boy club mentality had knew how to manage the female approach. It was, um, and, and they didn't know how to manage it. They didn't know how to develop it. And sometimes I think they were a little afraid of it, <laughs> to be honest with you. That was my experience. Um, and, um, and hence why, you know, the situation remains the same because that, that, that good old boys club, that network, that the managers that had been there that long, sure. um, hadn't really, um, probably started when there were very few women <laughs> in, in, in not only um, medical devices, but in leadership for sure. 
Right. So one of the things you talked about was how uh, share your experience of being in a meeting and your your how you approached. Sure. Um, what was happening? Because I think that's your one of your examples as to the difference in people not knowing how to respond. Right, right. So again, I told you I live fifty fifty in two different worlds in a, in the field culture and and then in the corporate culture. And in the corporate culture, it was very um, they were very open and welcoming of different uh, opinions and to come um, you know ultimately out with better results. And but in the field um, at a sales meeting when the um, they were delivering the sales strategy. Um, I raised a very valid question that everyone in the room felt. And I just had the courage to, to ask because um, maybe I took a little bit too much of that corporate culture out into the field. (laughs) And um, my general manager had, I mean, literally pounced on me and um, was very, Pounced on you for expressing your opinion. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. And, and raising a question. How dare I question? Um, and so he felt bad. He apologized. But I learned very quick not to ask questions or challenge the strategy. Um, at the same time, almost everyone in that room came up to me at some point and said, thank you for asking the question. That's what we were all thinking. So, you know, what? this is so interesting um, Karen, because it, it this is part of what Sally Helgeson's research shows is that I mean she looks at how women rise and what prevents women from moving within organizations. Her work is absolutely brilliant. So if you haven't read her book, How Women Rise, get a hold of it. Mm-hmm. But one of the things she talks about is as women, often because many of us are also mothers, we tend to be nurturing and we take care of the relationships and we want somebody to really um, deal with the things that are going to impact them. And we want clarity so people can understand and embrace their idea. And so we ask questions. We say things that we think are adding and improving in order to make them feel better. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, men look at that as being non-supportive. And men in the same discussion are more apt to be in agreement and to support the idea, even if they don't agree with it, in order to keep that person looking good. And they will choose to deal with a disagreement um, off the record, outside the meeting, um, individually, or they may choose not to deal with it at all. And so there's, so men, when we ask questions, tend to feel threatened. Why are you doing that to me? You're, you should be making me look good. On the other hand, women go, I need to make you look good. Let me help round this out so people can see the value of what you're doing. Right. Two different perspectives, and it does impact what we do in the corporate world and how people respond. And when women are in the minority, and the same is true with um, people of color, um, when people respond and you're in the minority, it doesn't tend to, to re- often result in a good result. Mm-hmm. Right. 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 Absolutely. There was a third thing challenge that you were talking about relative to different uh, cultures, two different cultures, sometimes more cultures in the same organization operational at the same time. And that was in relation to, um, panels where people are asked to come forward and interview for promotions so that they're ready for leadership. So it's really not so much the panel isn't the issue, it's planning for that um, leadership position and promotion within the corporation. So talk a little bit about your experience with that, because I think this is um, not only important in terms of looking at culture, but how do we effectively promote? So, sure, sure, sure. So, um, probably about halfway through my time with this company, they they started implementing what they called panel interviews for leadership positions or or promotions. And what that entailed was um, it was a two hour interview um, where you you presented uh, who you were for fifteen minutes. Um, 
what year an assessment of a department, let's say, or or a um, a team, and and then your um, objectives and goals if you were to assume a position. <clears throat> um, and um, initially, it was four specific positions, but then they started taking it to another level where it was like, okay, we don't have any positions, but let's see if we have some future leaders. And so let's put people through this process just for, to see how they, how they come out on the other side. Right. So no, you're not, you're interviewing, but not for a position, which if, how do you, how do you, how do you do that effectively without understanding the definition of what that, or the, or the roles and responsibilities of a position, right? So the results have been, very um, skewed, if you will, based on that. And, um, and so several people who have gone through this process have come out on the other side because after the interview, then you're, you're, you're given a report with the feedback from the panel. Um, and um, I'll give you an example of, of a woman that I um, am, am friends with who is a leader. Um, she, her results were, um, out of the four panelists, two said absolutely she's ready for a, 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 a leadership, a, a, the next level of leadership, <clears throat> um, whatever that is. And two said absolutely not. And so not only did it, um, not only can it be confusing and for the, the person interviewing, but also is the panel really aligned on what, what um, leadership looks like? Or leadership role, they they weren't clear clearly on that definition of what would make a a, a, a strong leader or the uh, a leader of the next level. Right. Um, and perhaps because they didn't have a position in mind, mm-hmm. they weren't as able to do that. But go on, yeah. yeah. So I mean that's that's the example really. Um, it it and, and again, um, you know, I would be curious to see how that. Um, uh, process would be it fits in with the corporate culture, even on the feedback side. Um, because I've known several who've gone through that process who were really hurt and offended by um, the feedback they received in the report, and they were hurt and offended because why they felt that some of the opinions were misrepresentative of who they were. It was and, and felt attacked a, a little bit. So uh, again, that is not something that I know that, that that corporate culture would promote or or allow. Um, right. So, so you know, was, what's so interesting about that, Karen, is on the one hand, what the company is trying to do is to grow leaders and to create an opportunity, right? So that's the positive side, and they're giving people opportunity to to step forward into that position. What's interesting is if there isn't follow-up and people become disengaged and discouraged, what happens is they become part of the revolving door, the exit, eventually the exit. So this talent pool that you're trying to grow potentially mm-hmm. is going to also potentially be your talent pool that's going to exit if you don't handle it well. Mm-hmm. So it's there's always a consequence for every action we take. And we do a lot of things, I think, in management um, with a desire to create opportunity without thinking through. If there isn't follow-up, if there isn't a way to manage it and to, um, if we're not clear about what it is that we're trying to do, we may have a consequence that we'll regret down the road. And I think in today's world <clears throat> where we have a shrinking um, <clears throat> employment mm-hmm. pool, the companies that are going to survive are going to be the ones who are able to really engage people. And here's the other thing that I think is really um, important. We're beginning to see, especially in Europe right now, a model emerging where companies are looking less at formal structures in terms of coming together through a merger or an acquisition as we do here, but creating more loose partnerships so you can move in and out. 
Today, these are the relationships I need. I'm going to grow them and work with them. Tomorrow, it's going to be here. And there's, so there's this fluid structure that you can kind of move and navigate around. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> when you're able to do that, you can now shift quickly. But think of that. If we're creating talent pool for a fictitious position and our world is shifting quickly, we may not be interviewing or using the right assessments for what it is that's coming very, very quickly. Right. You know, I think I think of when I was working a great deal in healthcare in with hospitals is that um, we used to say that if you were in a very high risk area where you were dealing with high acuity where there were a lot of problems, the half life of knowledge was about six months. So every six months things would shift. And in your mind you had to be prepared. What I know today may not be true tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So how am I preparing to be able to adjust and change? Same thing is true in management. If our structures of how we're going to relate to one another within an organization and then across organizations is becoming more fluid, how are we going to shift? And so how we're managing may, may really need to change quite dramatically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you said something there. So um, they, the, the thing about this exercise is that it was classified as a development opportunity. So that's why hence not the role or the defined position. So this is a way for you to develop. Um, they're, they're trying to chug along with that corporate mentality of let's develop people kind of maybe miss the mark with that. I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, <laughs> I think there are many <laughs> more, more positive ways that, 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 um, that in which people can be um, developed. But um, to your point about being fluid, and um, that's that's a whole other podcast for itself because um, change is typically um, uh, people don't take responsibility necessarily to their, their roles and their reactions to change, change. Most people resist change and they don't take the, the responsibility for um, personal responsibility for how they manage change. Um, and to your point, it's where the environment is so fluid right now in, in business and change is happening so quickly. That's a struggle for, for a lot of people. Um, and, and we could use a lot of training on that. Um, how do you personally um, react and navigate? I and mean, what's your responsibility in that? Because companies are going to change. They have Aren't to. Right? Yeah. And I think one of the things we have to come to grips with is almost all of our team management and leadership training is predicated on a concept of trust. Mm-hmm. We develop trust and then we work together. But when you have a lot of fluidity or you're cross-functional, you don't really have time to develop trust. And so what are models that we can use when trust is not the primary mode of operation? And it is not something we discuss, um, at least not openly. And there are models that can be used. And I think it's, it's a discussion that's really, really critical. And Organizations need to always have it in their back pocket because it is a reality of life. When it, while you have these kinds of models in place where there isn't trust, you develop trust, you grow it as, because that's also where you have more engagement. But you can put these models in place while you're doing the other. And it creates a greater sense of security and um, allows people to begin to develop when there's fear and there's change and there's uncertainty and volatility. And that is the world in which we live. Mm-hmm. So thank you, Karen. We have unbelievable. Our time always goes so fast. It does. <laughs> and so just to, to, um, to review what we've talked about are really three challenges the challenges of multi, uh, having different concepts and cultures and having clarity about what the culture is makes a huge difference. How we look at culture is going to be impacted by 
perhaps race and gender and our attitudes about that and how we respond. And it's something that we need to be very mindful of, irrespective of which group we're in. We as women need to be be aware of how we impact others. Men need to be more aware of women. And all of us need to be more aware of people of color so that we can be more integrated in terms of how we're approaching things. And then the third is, how are we growing and developing people? So these are the things that were, that um, impact us within cultures and how our attitude is about people and the culture that we're creating impacts how we deal with those challenges. So next week, we're going to talk a lot about um, communication and how do you cover your back? Because this is a world in which you need to know if you're going to survive, how are you going to cover your back? And what are you thinking about in relation to that? Thank you so much. If you've got comments or thoughts about what you would um, like to hear more about, let us know. Um, send us an email. We'll be glad to get back to you. Thank you so much, Karen, for your time and your experience and sharing it with us because that's how we all learn. Thank Thank you. you. Oh, Thank you. This is fun. (laughs) You've been listening to Building My Legacy Podcast with Dr. Lois Sanstegard. To book your appointment with Dr. Sanstegard, visit www.buildtomorrow.com.